it's wrong to criticize leaders of the church, even if the criticism is true. When we know spiritual truths by spiritual means, we can be just as sure of that knowledge as a scholar or scientist is of the different kinds of knowledge they have acquired by different methods. Members who have a testimony and who act upon it under the direction of their church leaders are sometimes accused of blind obedience. Of course we have leaders, and of course we are subject to their decisions and directions in the operation of the church and in the performance of needed priesthood ordinances. But when it comes to learning and knowing the truth of the gospel, our personal testimonies, we each have a direct relationship with God our Eternal Father and His Son Jesus Christ through the powerful witness of the Holy Ghost. This is what our critics fail to understand. It puzzles them that we can be united in following our leaders and yet independent in knowing for ourselves. As the LDS Church has grown, control over the Mormon story has become all the more important. That has led to increasing conflict with some Mormon intellectuals who challenge the church's official history and the authority of its leaders. The glory of God is intelligence, light and truth. Forsake the evil one. Ye are commanded to bring up your children in light and truth. Intellectuals, by their very nature, ask questions. They're curious. They see some statement made and they want to know why. The life of the mind can be seen to be in flat out opposition to one's faith. To be a Mormon intellectual means that you're opening up yourself to being called into a church court. I was excommunicated 13 years ago. My temple marriage to my husband is canceled, my ceiling to my child is dissolved. Basically, my eternal salvation is wiped out. One of the contradictions I see presently in Mormon culture is on the one hand, we have this long tradition of encouraging knowledge and education, and yet at the same time, there's a real anti-intellectual strain that's been there for quite some time. If you're an active LDS person and you want to write about Mormonism, there are just certain things that you cannot talk about. Certainly the temple is one of them, even if you're trying to do it in a faith-promoting way. And raising any kind of feminist question is something you cannot do. Questioning authority in any way, I think that this is probably one of the, the, the biggest taboos in Mormonism. There is the thought that intellectuals ask questions, questions lead to doubts, doubts lead to a loss of testimony, loss of testimony leads to you falling away from the church, and there's a great fear in the church that if you openly look at these things, that you will doubt, and if you doubt, well, there goes the whole purpose of life. The scriptures speak of prophets as being watchmen on the tower with the responsibility to warn when an enemy approaches the enclosure of the faithful. I think all of the leaders of the church are conscious of an obligation to warn the people when there's a danger. I think in any day the watchmen on the tower are going to say intellectualism is a danger to the church, and it is at extreme uh, points, and if people leave their faith behind and follow strictly where science leads them, uh, that can be a pretty crooked path. Ironically, the Mormon religion itself was born as an act of radical dissent. Joseph Smith had directly challenged the tenets of mainstream Christianity. 
but almost from the beginning he too was challenged by dissenters in his own church. He was quick to excommunicate, but also quick to allow people to return. His successor, Brigham Young, was tougher. Brigham Young's principle was simple. You are either with us or you're against us. If you are part of this people, fall into line, let's move on, and let's build up the kingdom of God and never forget that all we have is each other. We undermine each other's faith. We destroy ourselves. We've got to stick together. There's the highway or there's our way. Leave if you are not going to adhere to the rules. In the mid-20th century, the church began to forcefully discipline its intellectuals who challenged the orthodox view of Mormon history. The historian Fawn Brody had emerged from a devout Mormon family in Utah. In 1945, she published a biography of Joseph Smith that was the first to question the divine origins of Smith's revelations and the Book of Mormon. Although she was a niece of church leader David O. McKay, he didn't protect her, and she was excommunicated. In 1950, when Juanita Brooks published the first full account of Mormon complicity in the Mountain Meadows Massacre, she and her husband were shunned by members of their church. As official church historian, Leonard Arrington began opening church archives in 1972 and promoted a new Mormon history that was complex and objective. But after a decade of intellectual freedom, the church transferred Arrington's entire division from his control. The Mormon church has suffered dissent and excommunications from the very beginning. But I'd say in the last generation, there seems to be more disciplining, more nervousness, more excommunications. The church seems to be drawing in and wanting to sharpen its message. And in some cases, this really takes on a very harsh and personal edge. Each of us has two different channels to God. We have a channel of governance through our prophet and other leaders. This channel, which has to do with doctrine, ordinances, and commandments, results in obedience. Among current church leaders, Apostle Boyd Packer has emerged as the strongest voice of Mormon orthodoxy. When I was at BYU, Boyd K. Packer had given this speech, and I believe it was meant only for the insiders in the church office building, but it got out, as a lot of things do, get leaked in, in Utah, especially in Salt Lake and Provo, where he basically said one of the greatest dangers to the church were gays, feminists, and intellectuals. And there was a large group of us who fit many of those categories. It was like a slap in the face. It was like, we don't want you. I suppose uh, I, I think I remember saying those things. <laughs> if it's in print, I said it. <laughs> and, um, but that's part of the alert learning and and it's very simple down some of those paths you have a right to go there and but in the church you don't have a right to teach and take others there and without having some discipline simply because down the road there's unhappiness within the church we're not afraid of intellectuals or of learning or of knowledge. Where an intellectual, I think, can get into difficulty is when that intellectual person takes a position and begins either to attack the general leaders or local leaders of the church, or begins to attack the basic doctrine of the church and does that publicly. I, I, I think the hardest public relations sell we have to make is that this is the only true church. In a single month in 1993, the LDS Church excommunicated six prominent Mormon scholars whose work the church believed had gone too far in their investigations of polygamy, 
in pressing for priesthood for women and in challenging church authority. I was one of the first to be threatened. I was threatened with excommunication in the summer of 93. I received a letter from my state president. In this letter, I was told that I was not allowed to speak, discuss, publish, write about um, anything to do with church history or church doctrine, um, or they would hold a court on me. Those things that they had asked me not to speak about were women in the priesthood and the Mormon idea or the Mormon concept of a heavenly mother. The church had objected to a series of scholarly articles in which Toscano argued that Joseph Smith had intended that women be granted Mormon priesthood. It was a direct contradiction of the church's official doctrine that only men could hold that position. I am Mormon on a deep level, and I do not believe that a community can be spiritually healthy when it silences people. And that was my reason for not obeying the state president in the first place. I told him at the time, I said, I cannot be silent because for me to be silent is to participate in an abuse of authority and, a, and to damage the community that I care about. You have to imagine when you go into a church disciplinary court that you go in by yourself, you're not allowed to bring anybody with you. So I'm in there, there are 16 men that I am facing. The state president is presenting the case against me. And he did it in almost courtroom-like fashion. He had a set of notes and he had his reasons why I should be excommunicated. He also had a stack of copies of everything that I had written and it was kind of like this, a stack when uh, the state president was talking about all I had written about women in the priesthood was really wrong. And I tried to come in to defend myself doctrinally by quoting Joseph Smith and by using argument and reason. In the middle of the sentence, the state president interrupted me and he said, we will not allow you to lecture us. Um, we will not allow you to use this kind of reasoning again. You are only allowed to speak as we give you permission. And of course, I mean, I just kind of stopped mid-sentence. I, I couldn't go on. But you can imagine that this was, I mean, you don't really feel like you have much of a defense. Then they asked me to go out, and they deliberated for about 20 minutes, and then brought me back in. And the first thing that the state president said to me is, I want you to know that the High Council was very impressed with you. <laughs> However, you are excommunicated. We have found you to be an apostate. And everybody got up, and they all wanted to shake my hand. They're cutting me off from eternal salvation and telling me that I'm this apostate, which really is considered very bad in Mormon culture and yet I'm this nice woman that they're gonna shake my hand. And this, that, that niceness, there's something, there's something vicious about niceness that struck me in this, that the niceness covered over the violence of what was being done. Because in fact, excommunication is a violent action.